So thing one, if you choose you to be something, if we choose you, whenever I say choose you, it makes me think of that. Well, there's a Simpsons episode that aired a long time ago where Ralph says, I cho cho choose you. Anyway, um, if we choose you, we really want slash need the, the derivative of you to also be in the integral. So that's what we're hoping to get, right? We are really hopeful that when we make a choice for you, its derivative is also there. And really, we should say it's derivative up to a constant multiple, right? If you're off by a multiple of four or one fifth or whatever, that's okay. We can always adjust for a constant multiple. So that's what we hoped out. And then usually the way we look for you is by looking to see if it's stuck inside another function. So typically, u is stuck inside another function. Some examples of this. We're not going to do these ones right now, but let me just give you a few examples. And I'll make so. In these examples, my choice for u would be x cubed, and my du dx would be 3x squared. All of these integrals I'm about to write down, that would be the choice we would make. So we could have, say, the integral of x squared, that was me, let's say 3x squared e to the x cubed. Oh, look, our x cubed is stuck in the exponents. Or we could have the integral of x squared times sine of x cubed. Or we could have the integral of, mm, sure, x squared over the square root of x cubed. I don't think you don't need a square root. Notice this one, I would actually make a slightly different choice. So if you're choosing u to be something, Often you also may want to choose u to be that something plus a constant because constants kind of come along for free. The derivative of this is still that. Um, what else we could have? I'm trying, there's one other one that's kind of sticking out in my mind here. Um, oh, roots. You could have something like the integral of 6x squared times the fourth root of x cubed. So all of these are good examples of, oh, this x cubed, this x cubed, this x cubed plus two, this x cubed plus two. All of those are stuck inside some function. This is in the exponent of e. This is in the sine function. This is in the denominator. This is in the fourth root. So all of those are good clues that that should be our choice for you. In fact, we can do all of these. We'll do, let's do one or two. So let's do the integral of 3x squared e to the x cubed. We're going to let u equal x cubed. Our du dx is equal to 3x squared. Um, I would encourage all of you, instead of writing the derivative of u with respect to x equals 3x squared, I would encourage everybody to jump to the next step, which is writing or isolating du equals 3x squared times dx. Because that's really what we're looking for. Um, so I see, great. I see my, I see a not great pen, but I really see it. I see my du there. And so when I rewrite my integral, I'm always making sure I take care of changing the stuff with dx to the stuff with du before anything else. So this is going to be the integral of something du. And then the only thing that's left, I've taken care of the du. All of that 3x squared times dx is what du is made up of. The remaining part is e to the x cubed, which is going to be e to the u. We know how to integrate e to the u. 
it's e to the u. We'll see. And then that's going to be then we replace u with what it's equal to, which is x cubed. So we get e to the x cubed. We'll see. That's right. Let's do another one. Let's do one that's a little bit trickier. Let's do this one here. So we can fit this in here. Now we want to find the integral of x squared over x cubed plus two. Our choice of u here is similar, but not exactly the same. Here we're choosing u equal to x cubed plus two, right? because all of that's what's stuck in the denominator. If you wanted, I don't recommend it, but you could rewrite this as the integral of x squared times x cubed plus two to the negative one power. That might make it a little more concrete that that is actually stuck, right? You've got something raised to the negative first power. There's no kind of breaking that up or multiplying it up. It's just what it is. Um, but this is the way we usually write it. So our u is x cubed plus two, and the derivative du dx would equal 3x squared. So du is 3x squared dx. Now, I don't have a 3x squared dx. So there's actually two ways of dealing with this. The way I prefer to do it is to make whatever is on this right side look like what I actually have. I have an x squared times dx, so I'm going to divide both sides of this by three. So one third du equals x squared dx. Then I replace the x squared dx with one third du. This becomes the integral of one third du divided by x, squared, x cubed plus two is in fact our u. Now, usually I prefer to write this a little bit differently. I would write this as I would bring the one third out as a constant multiple. And you can write du over u, but I often find that less nice. I find this a little confusing, maybe. I prefer to write this as one third times the integral of one over u du. You'll definitely see this written both ways. People really like to write du over u, so you like to write one over u du. They are the same. So what's the integral, right? Take derivative of one over u. Natural log of the absolute value of u. And then we plug back in what u is. We get one third the natural log of the absolute value of, what was our u? It was x cubed plus two. So that's the way I prefer to do it. And there is a slightly different way. So if you're trying to adjust for a constant multiple like we did here, the other way to do it, which I don't like as much, but if you prefer it, it's also perfectly fine. Let me just show you in case you're curious. The other way to do this is to say, well, I would like to have a 3x squared dx. So I'm going to take my integral, x squared over x cubed plus 2 dx, and I'm going to modify it. I want to have a 3x squared, so I'm going to multiply it by 3. But we can't just multiply it by 3 because that's actually changing it. So we multiply by 3, you actually have to multiply by 1 third as well. So that we're really just multiplying it by 1. We're not really changing it. But now, the 3x squared dx, that's your du. And so we end up with 1 third the integral of du over u which is one third the natural log of the absolute value of u plus c, which is one third the natural log of the absolute value of x u plus two. Let's see. Questions about this? Okay, pat on my thumb, gross. Okay, whoops, whoops, whoops. Okay, um, let's see. Something to say here. Oh, I know what it was. Um, a question for you guys. Would any of you like me to talk about, I don't have to, but would anyone like me to talk about why the integral of one over x is equal to the natural log of the absolute value of x? Specifically, why there's an absolute value? Or do we not care? We're just going to 
be like, we're cool with that. We, we, we don't need to know why that is. Guys are like, eh, we go either way. Okay, good to know. What about for Morris? Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about it anyway because it seems like an appropriate time and it only takes a minute. So here's the reason why you get the absolute value. It has to do with domain. If you look at the function, one over x, its domain is everything except for zero. Looks like this. Domain is all real numbers except for zero. And the problem is the function natural log of x looks like this. And it has a domain that is everything which is positive. But the thing is, if you take, so if you take the derivative of the natural log of x, you do get one over x, but you only actually get, right? So if you take the derivative here, it is one over x, but only when x is greater than zero. So technically, this part of the function is actually what's the derivative of natural log of x. And this doesn't even get included at all. The problem is if you're anti-differentiating this, you still have to kind of consider the whole domain. So if you take the anti-derivative of this, we really should get a function that is also defined over here. And so what do we do? Well, we look at the natural log of the absolute value of x. Because if you look at the natural log of the absolute value of x, you actually get the left-hand side as well. I'm gonna erase some of this. So here is the natural log of the absolute value of x. It looks like this. If x is positive, you just get your normal natural log graph. If x is negative, well, the absolute value of a negative number is positive. So you actually get the reflection of this over here. Okay. So that's the antiderivative, but does it actually work? Well, yeah, it does. So here's the thing. And here's where it kind of really comes from. Yes, the derivative of the natural log of x is equal to one over x for x being greater than zero, right? Natural log is a domain that's x greater than zero. So it's derivative. Now basically when you take a derivative of a function, it's domain can't get larger. So it can shrink a little bit, but it can't get any bigger. What if we take the derivative of this? Well, the natural log of the absolute value of x is a piecewise function. It's all right. That's bad. Right so, a piecewise function. If x is positive, then the absolute value of x is just x. And you're taking the derivative of the natural log of x. Right? If x is positive, then absolute value of x is just x. But if x is negative, then you're taking the derivative of the natural log of negative x. And I want to be extra, extra clear about this, right? When taking the absolute value of x, if x is already positive, you just get x. But if x is negative, then you have to turn that negative into a positive by multiplying by negative one. So for example, the absolute value of six is just six. The absolute value of negative six is negative negative six, which is six. That's all we're doing here. So what we're saying is if x is negative, you have to put a minus sign in front of it to turn it into a positive. Okay, so now let's differentiate this. Well, we know the derivative of the natural log of x is one over x. And we know the derivative of the natural log of some stuff is one over the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. And the derivative of negative x is 
negative one. So look, these are the same. This is one over X and this is negative one over negative X, which is one over X. So this is equal to one over X, regardless of X is negative or positive. So what we're saying is the derivative of the natural log of the absolute value of X is equal to one over X. So the antiderivative of one over X is the natural log of the absolute value of X. So that's all I have to say. I'll write it again, very, very generally, the integral or antiderivative of one over x dx is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. You do need the absolute value because that is the more complete, correct answer. All right, any questions about this? Cool. Let's get back to our regularly scheduled program of talking about all the new substitutions. So let's look at Something like something like this the integral of I'm sure x plus three over x squared plus six x plus one squared. Yeah, let's make it let's make it to let's make it even more. So let's make it to the four. Okay, so, and, and I should kind of back up for one second. While we're certainly thinking you substitution, and I don't want to give you the false impression that every problem is going to be a U sub problem, right? There are lots of methods of integration we're going to learn. U substitution is one of them. It's kind of, it kind of ends up being like our favorite one because it's usually pretty straightforward. But the thing is, with integration, sometimes you have to guess, and sometimes we're going to guess wrong. So I'm going to guess, and these are all going to be U sub problems, but eventually we're going to start using other methods of integration. We'll be like, okay, well, we're going to try U sub. What makes sense to use for you? Oh, it didn't work. Maybe we should try something else. So here, what makes sense to try for you? Well, I've got an x squared plus 6x plus 1 stuck inside the denominator and inside the fourth power. So it's pretty likely that x squared plus 6x plus 1 is our choice for you. Our du is 2x plus 6 times dx. Do I have that? Not exactly. Do I have a multiple of that? I do. What could I multiply both sides of this equation by so that we get an x plus 3 times dx? Well, it looks like a 1 half. 1 half times du equals one half times two x plus six dx. One half times two x plus six is gonna be x plus three. This is x plus three dx. Great, so here's what we've got. This is what we got. And again, I'm gonna say this every time. You wanna make sure you deal with changing the stuff with dx to the stuff with du first. So I like to circle my dx or whatever my dx thing is. So this x plus three dx, that's my one half d. I'm not going to write any of this again because all of that's being taken care of by the one half d. This is going to equal one half d u divided by the denominator is u to the fourth, right? I replace all the other things with their u things. Now we should rewrite this integral. It's going to be the inter one half the integral of u to the negative fourth. Right. We don't we don't really have a way of integrating one over u to the fourth without rewriting it as u to the negative fourth. Then we're going to use the anti-power rule. We're going to get u to the negative four plus one, which is negative three, divided by negative three plus c. This coefficient one half times negative one third becomes negative one sixth. So we get a negative one sixth times u which is x squared plus 6x plus 1 to the negative third plus c. Or if you prefer, if you don't like having negative powers, you can rewrite your answer as negative 1 over 6 times x squared plus 6x plus 1 cubed. Plus c. Either way of writing this should be perfectly acceptable.
questions about this? I'm gonna stop asking this. If you have questions, just chime in, right? You know, I will always stop the questions. Let's look at this one. Let's say I've got the integral of cosine of the square root of x over the square root of x. This one presents kind of an issue that I'm well, we'll get there. So anybody have a guess for the choice of you? Anybody, 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 anybody? Somebody. And like, I don't want to participate. Okay, fine. I'll do it myself. So the choice for you here most likely is going to be the square root of x. We see the square root of x stuck inside the cosine function. We also see the square root of x stuck inside the denominator. So it seems like the square root of x is a good choice. Oh, by the way, and this is kind of this is a little dicey, u equals x is never a good choice for a u substitution. Because if you let u equal x, you're just changing all the x's to u that you haven't changed the problem at all. In contrast to that, if you're doing integration by parts, it is perfectly fine to let u equal x and dv equal something else, which I know we're not there yet, but I just want to point out, u substitution, u equals x is never the right choice. Integration by parts, it's perfectly fine to let u equal x if that's the right choice. So don't let u equal x when you're doing a u sub, you're just making more work for yourself. So let's see here. Um, I need to find my du. So du is going to be, let's see. 1 over, oh, I should write this as x over 1 half. My du is going to be 1 half x to the negative 1 half. All right, the derivative of that and then times the x. And here's where I want to point out it would be really, really easy to kind of do the wrong thing. The wrong thing here would be say, well, look, I've got a u there and a u there. This is equal to the integral of cosine of u du, oh, sorry, cosine of u over u, dx. That's a problem. I made the mistake of not taking care of the dx part first. So you really, really, really want to make sure you do that first. So this is not right. Here's what we should be doing instead. I want to rewrite this so it looks easier to handle. I know that x to the negative one half is one over x to the one half, which is one over the square root of x. So this is really du equal to one over two square roots of x. And look, I have a one over root x times dx. I could rewrite this integral as the integral of cosine of the square root of x times one over the square root of x times dx. But that's a little bit easier to see what's happening here. Um, I, still, I still don't have a two though, so let's multiply both sides of this by two. So two du equals one over the square root of x dx. So then, okay, you can either, running out, running out of pens, either see it here, there's your dx over the square root of x, or you can see it here. There's your one over root x dx. Either way, that is your two du. So I'm gonna rewrite this as the integral of, I'm gonna deal with this part first, two du. Constant multiples we can always put out in front of the integral. And then this is gonna be cosine of u. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. The antiderivative of cosine is positive sine. This is going to be two times positive sine of u plus c. And then finally replacing u with what it's equal to. This is going to be two times sine of the square root of x plus c. Great. Um, 
Let's see, how many more of these? We have a time. It's 9.30-ish. Let's do, hmm, yeah, let's do one or two more. And then we'll, and then we'll do some definite interval ones. Uh, we're not, the, yeah. Problem is, I want to say a lot of other things, but we're not quite there yet. Let's do this one. Let's do the integral of like, sine of x and cosine cubed of x dx. So, technically, you could choose either thing here. You could choose u equal to sine, and then your du would be cosine, and you'd have to have a cosine x times dx. But you actually have more than one cosine x dx. So if you could make the less good choice would be sine, even though it feels nicer because your sine is positive cosine, your cosine is negative sine. Um, but the thing is, I want to choose the u that's kind of more stuck. And here we have cosine x quantity two. So if you wanted to rewrite this, you could rewrite this as sine of x times cosine of x quantity cubed dx. It seems like u equal to cosine. Is a more natural choice because it's the thing that's stuck inside that function. And its derivative is still essentially there. The derivative of cosine is negative sine of x. So du is negative sine of x times dx. So I've got all that. Um, I need to adjust for the negative. So let's make it a negative du equals a positive cosine of x dx. So I'm going to re rewrite this as, let's see. Mm, did I, did I, I wrote the wrong thing here. Apologies, right? It should be negative sine, not negative cosine. I'm sorry, it should be sine, not cosine. And just multiply both sides by a negative. So here's my negative d. So be careful when you write this. If you write this this way, it's gonna, I'm going to write it actually kind of wrong. So I've got my negative du, and I've got my u cubed. But the thing is, it's not u cubed minus du. It is u cubed times negative du, which is another good reason why it's really better just to pull any constant multiples, in this case, a negative, negative, or negative 1 out in the front. So I would really rather write this as negative the integral of u cubed times du. And that's actually a blanket statement I should make. When you're rewriting integrals, you're always multiplying by du, right? There's never anything else. You don't add du, you don't subtract du, you don't divide by du. It is always the thing you're integrating times du, because that's the notation we have to have for it to make sense that we're doing this antiderivative with respect to the variable u in this case. So then we have to differentiate, we get negative u to the fourth over four plus a constant. And then we plug in our u, which is cosine of x, and we get negative cosine to the fourth of x to the four plus c. Bonus question. Let's call this, mm, sure. Let's call this f of x. And let's say we also know the following. We know that f of, what do I want to pick here? Sure, let's, let's make it fun. Uh, sure. f of pi over 4 is equal to 8. I want to find the function f of x. So this is what's known as an initial condition problem, right, where you're asked to find the antiderivative of a function and then also find the constant. Right? Given this information that we know how to evaluate our function at some point, we can solve for the constant c. So that's all this means. If you're asked to find an antiderivative, they give you another piece of information like f of something equals something. It just means figure out what that constant c is. Let's do that. So let's see, we plug in pi over 4. So f of pi over 4 is going to equal negative 
cosine of pi over four to the fourth power all over four plus c dash is equal to eight. Okay, so what's cosine of pi over four? It's square root of two over two. So we get negative square root of two over two over four. Oh, sorry, to the fourth over four. Yeah, square root of two over two to the fourth. What's the square root of two to the fourth power? Let's see. Square root of two times the square root of two is two. Square root of two times the square root of two is two. And two times two is four. This is actually going to be uh, negative, let's see, four, right? Square root of two to the fourth is four. Two to the fourth is 16. Wow. Amazing how you can say 16 and write four. And then divided by four plus C equals eight. So it looks like our C value Our C value is going to equal eight plus whatever that number is. That's going to be, I want to say, you can cancel a four here and a four here and just get one over 16. So C is eight plus one sixteenth, or if you really, really want to do the math, it's 129 sixteenths. So my final answer would be that F of X is negative cosine to the fourth of X over four plus 129 sixteenths. Fun times. Let's see. I think. Yeah. Let's do one more. One more, and then we'll do some different. Let's look at this one. Say the integral of x to the fourth times x to the sixth plus one squared. Is there a good choice for you here? Can we pick x to the sixth plus one? I mean, we can. Will it work? Not really. If we pick u equal to x to the sixth plus one, or du is six x to the fifth dx. And while you can certainly adjust for a constant multiple, we really cannot adjust for having the wrong power of x, right? We're not, well, I mean, it's not that you're not allowed, but let, let me show you what I mean. If I tried to make this into an x to the fourth dx, I would have to divide by a six and an x. So I'd say, okay, one over six x du equals x to the fourth dx. So that's a problem. Because when I start rewriting this, my x to the fourth dx will be one over six x du. And this will be u squared. And the problem is I still have an x. And when you're doing these u substitution problems, you should think of them like um, as it's kind of like language translation. Meaning, well, it's so not a good example because people definitely say words from different languages all the time. But pretending like we're trying to translate every word in English to every word in Spanish, right? All of the X's have to translate to just use, but you can't have any X's left. You can't have any English words left if you're translating to Spanish. So this is a problem. We've got some U's and X's. We've got some Spanglish here, which is an issue mathematically. It's fine. Um, we can't do anything about that. That's not entirely true. If you really want to make it complicated, you could solve this for x and do what's called a back substitution. It wouldn't make this problem any better. So the point of this really is to observe that sometimes you can't do a u substitution. It might look like you should try u sub, but then it doesn't work. So what do we do here? Well, since this power is only a second power, we can just multiply this out. And this is actually going to be written as the integral of x to the fourth times x to the six plus one squared is x to the twelve plus 2x to the 6 plus 1. And then if we distribute the x to the 4th, that's equal to x to the 16th plus 2x to the 10th plus x to the 4th dx. And then the integral of that's going to be x to the 17th over 17 plus 2x to the 11th over 11 plus x to the 5th over 5 plus c. So sometimes you just got to multiply it out. That's life.
That's math. But the point of that really is if you're trying a method and it doesn't seem like it's going to work, and I know it's, it's still kind of a little early in our methods of integration conversation to really kind of know this for real, but what we're going to see as we can go along and we learn how to do integration by parts and partial fractions, some other things. If you're trying one method and it seems like it's getting really, really funky, super hard, complicated, don't force it. Try something else because it's probably the, I mean, occasionally things are really, really janky and tough and you have to like make it work. But most of the time, if you're doing a thing integration wise and it looks like it's just getting super duper ugly, try something else. You're probably not using the right method of integration. Um, let's look at, let's see, where do I definitely roll methods? Sure, yes, okay. All right, let's look at this example. And so the thing about definite integrals with you substitution is there are two legitimately different ways of doing it. I mean, they're essentially the same, but they do have a little bit different. So let's look at this. Let's do the integral from zero to two of three X squared over one plus X cubed to the third. Okay. So we can see the choices here. I think it's pretty clear that u is going to be one plus x cubed and du is going to be three x squared dx. Great. So one way to do it is not change the limits of integration. We are not going to change so then typically what we do is we just don't write them so okay i've got the integral of well let's see that's that's my du over u to the third power which i can write as the integral of u to the negative third du and we can integrate that we're going to get u to the negative second over negative two or one over sorry negative one over two u squared and then we can say that if we plug back in x we're going to get or sorry what u is equal to in terms of x which is one plus x cubed that's going to be negative one over two times one plus x cubed squared evaluated between zero and two So that's going to give us, let's see, negative one over two times one plus two cubed is eight, one plus eight, which is nine, nine squared. So you get negative one over two times nine squared, which is 81, minus negative one over two times one plus zero cubed, which is just, I don't really want to simplify that. Okay. This is my less preferred way of doing it. The other way of doing it is where we change the limits of integration. So looking at what u is equal to in terms of x, our lower limit of integration is x equal to zero. Our upper limit of integration is x equal to two. So if x equals zero, u is gonna equal one plus zero cubed which is just one. If x equals two, u is gonna equal one plus two cubed, which is u equal to nine. So we can rewrite our limits of our integral as the integral from one to nine of du over u cubed, which is gonna give me u to the negative second over negative two from one, right? I, I, you know, I saw the same mark as here, so I just jump straight to that. And then I like to rewrite this as negative one over two u squared from one to nine. And then we plug in the nine and we get negative one over two times 81. And then we plug in the, the one and we get negative one over two times one. 
And look, the answers are the same. So which way should you do it? Whichever way is better for you. Personally, I do it, I like to do it this way because if you do it this way, you don't have to go and plug back in what the U is equal to in terms of X and then plug in your one for integration. So I think most of the time you're better off changing limits of integration, but you have to remember that if you change limits of integration, you don't then plug back in what U is in terms of X. You just leave it all in terms of U and then you plug in U equal to nine and U equal to one. I feel like this is better. It's a little, it's a, it is a little bit more precise. It feels still slightly dishonest. I mean, not dishonest. It feels slightly incorrect to, to not write any limits of integration here, but some teachers are totally cool with you doing it this way. So really what you should do is you should make sure you're doing it the way your teacher wants you to do it. Um, if they don't have a preference, I would encourage you, I would encourage you all to land on this side of things where you change the limits of integration, I think it's a better way to do it. I feel like it's less, in some ways, less work, certainly less writing. So let's look at some more examples. Like all my examples went away. I thought I had more definite real examples, but just don't. Okay, let's look at some more. Let's take a look at the integral from, it seems like, oh yeah, from, from zero to four of x times the square root of nine plus x squared dx. Sometimes the numbers come out really terribly. Sometimes people are thoughtful and they come out pretty nice. So here we're gonna choose u. I'm gonna choose the u that's stuck inside the square root for the usual two reasons. Reason one, it's stuck in, well, reason two, really, but for, it's stuck inside the square root or some of the function. And reason one, to right, the first reason we look for it really is that the derivative of the stuff inside here is essentially x. It's 2x, but that's close enough. So our u is 9 plus x squared. Our du is 2x dx. And let's go ahead and think about changing the limits of integration as well. If u is 9 plus x squared, if x equals the lower limit 0, u is going to equal 9 plus 0 squared. If x equals the upper limit 4, u is going to equal 9 plus 4 squared, which is 25. Okay, so using all of this, we're going to rewrite our integral as, well, first and foremost, I'm still, oh, I didn't, I didn't do one small thing. I didn't deal with making this what I want it to be. So I should also multiply both sides of that by one half and say one half du equals x dx. Okay, so now x dx, all of that's going to get sucked up by my one half du. So I've got a one half du. I no longer need to consider either of those. I've, I've essentially dealt with them. They've been dealt with. I did not really cancel out, but right. Make sure you're not trying to still put them in your integral after you've dealt with them. And then the square root of nine plus x squared is going to be the square root of u. Or I would, well, let's just going to write the square root of u. My lower limit of integration was zero for x. Now it's u equals nine. My upper limit of integration was x equals four. Now it's u equals 25. Sometimes people even do some things like, right, on this integral, this is x equals zero to x equals four, and this is u equals nine to u equals 25. Well, not necessary, but sometimes it's a good thing. All right, um, the square root of u is really u to the one half. So then we're gonna anti-differentiate that. We're gonna get one half times u to the one half plus one is three halves. Dividing by three halves is equivalent to multiplying by two thirds from nine to 25. One half times two thirds is one third. So we get one third times, if I plug in 25, I get 25 to the three halves minus nine to the three halves. 
You could have also written it as one third times 25 to the three halves minus one third times nine to the three halves. But when you've got a constant multiple in your answer, it often just makes sense to factor it out so you're not having to do that calculation additionally and just plug in that to the variable parts. So let's see, what's 25 to the three halves? Um, well, the square root of 25 is five and five to the third is 125. The square root of nine is three, three to the third is 27. Um, you can do that the other way. You can say nine to the third is 729, and then the square root of 729 is 27. But you shouldn't do it that way. You should always do the root part first and the power part second. Similarly, right, if you're trying to find eight to the four thirds power, you don't want to do eight to the fourth power. Eight to the fourth power is 4,096. You don't want to do the, and then the cube root of 4,096 is going to be 32. Instead, right, that doesn't sound, I feel like I made a mistake there. Um, anyway, no, it's going to be, yeah, no. Keep root of 4,096 is 16. Anyway, the easier way to do this is take the third root of eight, which is two, and then two to the fourth is 16. If you ever have fractional powers like that, always do the root part first, the power part second. It's just easier. Anyway, this is one third of 125 minus 27, which is one third of 98 and 98 eighths. That's our answer. So, what else? I mean, we can do lots, we can do more of these. I'm wondering if there's, any, if there's anything I'm missing. Let me go ahead and take a quick peek at, I'm just trying to see if there's anything that looks totally heinous on your guys' homework assignment. I don't think so. I feel like we're pretty much, pretty much right in the vein. Oh, we should do one, we should do some of those, yeah, okay. Let's do some trig. There are definitely some trig ones in the comment. So, yeah. let's do, let's do the integral of e. And they're using some different variables as well. Sure, we can use different variables. Let's do sine of y over four plus cosine of y dy. And I guess we can go ahead and make this definite as well. Let's go from zero to pi over two. Sounds very exciting. So what should our choice for u be here? Well, again, we're usually trying to pick, oh, um, that's a, someone asked if I'd be posting in practice handles to the midterm tomorrow, or should we just go to Grant's website? Um, I don't feel like Grant's, let me, let me take a look. I feel like Grant's website doesn't particularly have any 16D practice materials. Um, let me ask you guys, have, have either of your instructors given you any practice exam materials? Okay, one second, I'm taking a look. That's not what I wanted at all. Anybody? Anybody? Um, okay, there, there, so I take it back. We have the solutions to our quiz on the best. Day. Okay. Um, there are some practice exam materials on Grant's website, um, which I think is definitely, yeah. I, I, I think, I mean, honestly, I would probably post something very similar. So I will give you all, I mean, I'm sure you guys can find it on your own, but in case you can't, here is the specific link to the Co-16 midterm one review problems that I would encourage you all to look at. They definitely seem very reasonable and relevant problems. Um, yeah, I think those all seem, oh yeah. There's a couple in there that are a little tricky, one of them specifically that we'll definitely look at today. So let's look at this integral here. Um, Sorry, I feel like I didn't really answer your question though, person asked it. So I would say I probably won't post something because what I would post would probably be what I just, the link I just sent you guys. That said, I think the practice problems there are good. And also if you go to the more main page, there are solutions there as well. And here is the link to the main page. Oh, almost not a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so for this one, 
as is typical, we see some stuff in the denominator that's probably our choice for you. We could pick u equal to just cosine, but I'd rather pick u equal to four plus cosine of y. So then my du is going to be zero minus sine of y, which I would just say is minus sine of y du. And I'll have a negative here, so I'm going to say negative du equals sine of y. So let's rewrite our interval. So let's see here. Sine of y dy is going to become negative du. Let's put the negative out front. And 4 plus cosine y is going to be u. Also, we should change our limits of integration. So if u equals 0, sorry, u is not 0, y is 0, sorry. If y equals 0, then u is 4 plus cosine of 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. That's going to give us u equal to 4 plus 1, which is 5. If y equals pi over 2, u is going to equal 4 plus cosine of pi over 2. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so you're going to get 4 plus 0, which is 4. So be careful. It might be very tempting to write the limits of integration as 4 to 5, but y equals 0 is the bottom limit, and y equals 0 corresponds to u equals 5. So we actually have to write a 5 there. And then y equals pi over 2 is the upper limit, so u equals 4 is the upper limit. And here's something that's actually really nice. We can change the order of integration, and it just so happens that we've got a negative sign out there already. It's going to cancel that out. So you could totally write this as positive the integral from 4 to 5 of 1 over u. Totally works. And then we anti-differentiate. We get the antiderivative of 1 over u, which is the natural log of the absolute value of u. And then we have to plug in from 4 to 5. So we get the natural log of 5 minus the natural log of 4, or the natural log of 5 fourths. Notice that I did not write the absolute values here because I didn't need them because the absolute value of 5 is 5 and the absolute value of 4 is 4. Yeah. Else I want to say about that? Not really. Um, I will mention just because it kind of worth mentioning. If you were just anti-differentiating this without any definite interval, you're just doing the antiderivative of sine of y over four plus cosine of y dy. From here, you would get the negative natural log of the absolute value of u. And from there, you would get the negative natural log of the absolute value of 4 plus cosine of 1. Plus C. Yeah. Right here. Um, I think I have more, more problems somewhere. I'm always hiding them from myself. I will also, I am also noticing that at least on the, um, on the Lee homework assignment that's due on next week, it looks like none of those are definite angles. It looks like they're all indefinite. Um, so I don't know how much time you might want to practice the definite angles since they don't seem to be on there. Let's, oh yeah, let's look. So this whole thing about u substitution kind of goes back to something I think we said before. Like if you integrate something like hmm, sine, oh not sine. Let's say you integrate something like secant squared of seven x. Well, we know that the antiderivative of secant squared of x is tangent of x, and if you do secant squared of seven x, you're going to get tangent of 7x, but then what do we need to divide by? Thanks. We need to divide by 7. 
really this is because of how you substitution works. But you can also do this problem by saying, well, I'm going to let u equal 7x. And the derivative of 7x is 7. So du is 7 dx, 7 times dx. And then 1 over 7 du is equal to dx. So we can totally rewrite this integral as 1 seventh the integral du, right? That's by dx is equal to 1 seventh du. And then secant squared of 7x becomes secant squared of u. And then the antiderivative of secant squared of u is tangent of u. And then 1 seventh times tangent of u becomes 1 seventh times tangent of 7x. So this is totally the reason why when you have a function of a multiple of x, you end up dividing by that coefficient of x. Because if you did the u substitution, if you let u equal the multiple of x, then your du will be that multiple of dx. And then dividing by that multiple, it gives you what dx is equal to. So your dx will be one over your coefficient of x times du. And then that's what's going to replace this here. And you're totally going to get that one over your coefficient of x. Always happens that way. I like to call this what's what I call a mini u substitution. Whereas it, you could do a u sub for it, but you shouldn't really ever have to do a u sub. Um, one more example of this. If we were going to integrate, say, e to the 4x dx, we could do a u substitution. We could say u is equal to 4x du is equal to 4dx, and 1 over 4du is equal to dx. But we could also say, we know how to integrate this. The integral of this is e to the 4x divided by 4, or multiplied by 1 4. And I would encourage, I know we did this before, but I'm just revisiting it. I would encourage everyone to be comfortable with this, right? You don't want to have to spend the time to say, oh yeah, my u sub is u equals 4x, my du is 4 times dx, 1 over 4 times du is equal to dx. And so then this integral is 1 fourth du, integral of e to the u. That's 1 fourth e to the u plus c, which is 1 fourth e to the 4x plus c. But you can do it that way, it just takes more time. Okay, I definitely spotted. Mm -hmm. I don't see anything that's tricky, but I, there, so there is a couple trick, tricky integrals that I feel like you guys should know about. They do occasionally come up. They're very tricky if you don't know the trick, but they're super straightforward if you do know the trick. Here, here's two of them, the ones that I can think of now. Um, the integral of tangent squared x dx and the integral of, there's a couple different versions of this. I'm going to do it as 1 over e to the negative x plus 3. So this one first. Um, tangent squared x, u sub, I don't know. The trick here is a trig. And I, might, I, I feel like, so I have a small issue in that I teach 16B in the morning on Tuesdays and Thursdays and 21B in the afternoons on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So it's hard for me to remember which integral things I've said to which class. So I might be repeating myself some of the time. It's okay. It's good to hear things again. Um, but the thing I'm saying that I might have said before is we have a tree and then you put tangent squared. It's one plus tangent squared x equal to secant squared x. And if I had said this before, you would tell me that, oh, James, you mean the I tan and get sexy trig identity? Yes, I tan and get sexy. I actually don't tan, I burn. But I tan and get sexy, you can never forget it. It is burned into your brain forever. As your teacher said, I tan and get sexy. One plus tangent squared x equals secant squared x. That means tangent squared x equals secant squared x minus one. And we can definitely integrate secant squared x minus 1. What's the antiderivative of secant squared? Oh, it's tangent. What's the antiderivative of 1? Oh, it's x. 
So the antiderivative of tangent squared x is tangent x minus x plus a constant. Very straightforward once you know the trick. Same kind of deal for this one. This one, this is like, I mean, I could try. So here's the problem. If you try letting u equal e to the negative x plus 3, your du, well, the derivative of e to the stuff is e to the stuff times the derivative of that stuff. Derivative of 3 is, constant, is a constant. That's derivative of 3 is 0. Um, but I, I don't have that. So here's the trick. When you see something over e to the negative x plus 3, or really, if you see a constant over e to a power plus 3, you want to multiply the entire thing by e to the opposite sign power. So I'm going to multiply the top and bottom. Well, I'm going to multiply by 1, right? Because that's all I'm allowed to multiply by. But I'm going to multiply this by e to the x over e to the x. On top, e to the x times 1 is e to the x. In the denominator, e to the x times e to the negative x is e to the 0, right? Because you add the powers, and negative x plus x is 0. And e to the 0 is 1. And e to the x times 3 is 3 e to the x. And now we can do a u sub letting u equal our new denominator. So u is 1 plus 3 e to the x. And my du is the derivative of this is 3e e to the x, so du is 3e e to the x times dx. And then I need to account for the 3, 1 third du equals e to the x dx. So look, there's my e to the x dx. So this is equal to 1 third du over u. We know the antiderivative of du over u is the same as the antiderivative of 1 over u du, which is the natural log of the absolute value of u. So here we're going to get 1 third the natural log of the absolute value of u plus c, um, which is equal to 1 third the natural log of the absolute value of 1 plus 3 e to the x. And I will mention. You should totally leave it like this, but you might see, like you're looking at a textbook answers, you might see them not write the absolute values here, then you might write parentheses instead. The reason for that is because 1 plus 3 e to the x is always positive, so you don't actually need the absolute values. Um, someone asked me if I recommend you review the different trig identities before the exam. I don't think that's super necessary. Um, I mean, you should obviously be aware of them. Right, sine squared plus cosine squared x, sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals one, one plus sine squared x equals secant squared. Um, but I really, I don't really anticipate, I don't think they would come up on this exam other than, right, I mean, so yeah, I, I would say probably no to thinking too hard about any of the identities, but they will come up a little bit as this course progresses. So in general, it would be worth kind of brushing up, making sure. You know how the trig identities work, but I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to say no. You don't need to know them, and then have them show up on this exam. Right? I would feel terrible about them, but I I don't imagine them coming up on this exam. I certainly haven't seen them in any of your homework problems. Um, let me see. There was another problem I wanted to do. Yeah. So. Mm, not there yet, though. Let me see one thing here, real quick. Yeah, I should do this problem. Okay, let's look. Let's say I want to do the integral of just sine of x over cosine of x, which is the integral of, um, oh, what did I want to say? It? Of tangent, right? This is the integral of tangent. So what's a good choice for you here? Well, it seems like there might be two different good choices. Should we pick, and I want to hear you guys say something here. Should I pick the, so you can say option one or option two. Option one, should I pick u equal to sine of x? 
or option two, should I pick u equal to cosine of x? You guys can write a private message. You can write it in the chat. I just want to know what you guys think. Which of these, is, or does it not even matter? You can say option three, doesn't matter. All right, type something in the chat, either privately or not. What do you think? Should I do number one, number two, number three? Come on, I want to see, I see one person has responded. I would like to see more signs of life. I see a variety of options here. I see one, threes, and twos. Let's try them both. So let's try u equal to sine of x. If we do that, our du, our derivative of sine, is going to be cosine of x times dx. Now I want to point out we don't have that. So this is actually, it's very important which choice we make here. What I have here is sine of x, <clears throat> sorry. What I have here is the integral of sine of x times one over cosine of x times dx. Right? I don't have cosine x times dx, I have dx divided by cosine x, which is not the same thing. So we actually can't do it this way. And in general, it's typically going to be the case where if you have a choice between picking the thing in the numerator or the denominator, the thing in the denominator is what I like to call being stuck. The thing in the numerator is not. But being in the denominator, you can't really get out of the denominator. I mean, you can write it as like the thing to the negative first power, but that's still being stuck inside another function. On the other hand, if we pick u equal to cosine x, our du is going to be negative sine of x times dx. And then we can tell us, say, oh, look, I do have a sine of x times dx. So I can say negative du is positive sine of x dx. And I can rewrite this integral as the integral of negative du over u, or negative integral of 1 over u. So I end up getting the negative natural log of the absolute value of u plus c, which is the negative natural log of the absolute value of cosine of x. So when it comes to fractional integrals, it really, really does that. And like, um, yeah, let's, let me, let me see. Yeah, I got one other, I got another example that's similar to this. Um, but what, what I'm saying is it really does matter. And almost without a doubt, the choice you want to make is that you should be the thing on the bottom. Um, so oh, I had an example, now I've forgotten it. Yeah. So for example, if we have the integral, sorry, one sec. Yes. If we have, say, the integral of e to the x over 2e to the x plus 1, totally works to let u equal the denominator here. u is 2 e to the x plus 1. Our du is the derivative of 2 e to the x plus 1 is 2 e to the x dx. And so then we can say 1 half du equals e to the x dx. And we're good to go because we have an e to the x times dx. So this becomes the integral of, let's see, e to the x dx is 1 half du. And we get a one over u, which is going to be one half the natural log of the absolute value of u plus c, which is one half the natural log of the absolute value of two e to the x plus one. Plus c. And again, in this problem, if you wanted to, you could totally drop the absolute values and just say it's one half natural log of parentheses two e to the x plus one plus c. On the other hand, if you look at the reciprocal integral, so look at the integral of 2e to the x plus 1 over e to the x. Now it really doesn't work, right? You, you could try letting u equal e to the x, but du is e to the x dx, which is problematic because I don't just have an e to the x times dx, right? I have, it's all of this times dx. 
And I, this e, right, you can't say it's this e to the x times dx because I don't have that. It's one over e to the x times dx. And so that doesn't work. And you can't really let u be the top part. Right? If u equals two e to the x plus one, you're still getting du equal to just two e to the x dx, which again, I don't have. Right? I have a two e to the x plus one times dx. Um, this problem isn't a u substitution problem. This problem is a simplify it and just integrate it problem. When you have a fraction and the denominator has a single term, often you can just divide each thing by that single term. So for this one, um, I've seen people definitely uh, draw it like this, where they say like, oh, you can do this and that. I've seen that kind of thing people do often. Two e to the x divided by e to the x is just two. And one divided by e to the x is one over e to the x or e to the negative x. The antiderivative of two is two x. The antiderivative of e to the negative x is e to the negative x divided by the coefficient of x, which is divided by negative one. But really dividing by negative one is the same as multiplying by negative one. So it would be nicer to write this as two x minus e to the minus x plus c. That's how I would write the answer. Okay. Let's see what else looks reasonably good to look at. Sorry, oh, there we go. Anything else on this handout? That's sure. Okay, let's look at. Do the integral of the natural log of x cubed over x dx from one to ten. Okay, so let's see. Is it a u sub? It is u sub. Um, one thing to be aware of here. One thing to be aware of here is that. The natural log of x cubed is not the same as the natural log of x cubed. The natural log of x cubed, where it's the natural log of that, that is where you can bring down the three and say it's three natural log of x. Here we cannot bring down the three in the power as the, in front. So just want to point out right? this and this, not the same. But I can do a use of, I can let u equal the natural log of x. And the derivative of the natural log of x is 1 over x. And I've got a 1 over x dx, right? Sometimes I like to write it out. I like to write this as natural log of x quantity cubed times 1 over x dx. It's not absolutely necessary, but it does make it a little more explicitly clear that, oh, yeah, that's my du. Or you could say, oh, yeah, that's my du. Either way is fine. Um, so then we're going to integrate this, or we're going to rewrite it, sorry. It's the integral of natural, log, oh, sorry, this is du. Well, oh, so you can carry the du, dx du first. And then natural log of x cubed is u cubed. Should I change my to integration? I think so. So if x equals 1, u equals the natural log of 1, which is 0. If x equals 10, u equals the natural log of 10, which doesn't really simplify. It's just the natural log of 10, which is just a number. I don't know what it is. It's probably a little bit bigger than 2. So now we're going to anti-differentiate. We're going to get u to the fourth over four from zero to the natural log of 10. All right, so plug in the natural log of 10, you get natural log of 10 to the fourth power over four. And you could plug in the zero, but when you plug in the zero, you're gonna get zero to the fourth over four, which is just zero. So there's our answer. <laughs>